In this video, I'd quickly like to review the theory of resonance. And what I'd like to do is start from the assumption that you've seen resonance already, but overlay your understanding with the building block formalism that we've developed in this lesson. The idea is that I think after having the building blocks in hand and seeing a few examples, you'll see that resonance is really just a matter of finding electron sources and sinks adjacent to one another within building blocks. In fact, this will be our foundational definition of resonance throughout the semester. We're going to explore some more exotic cases of resonance in a future lesson, but for now, I want to lay out in general how we'll view resonance as, by definition, the placement of an electron source next to an electron sink within a molecule. Anytime that occurs and the associated orbitals can overlap, which we'll talk about again in a later lesson, we see resonance becoming important. So what is resonance really and how do we know when resonance is important for a molecule under study? Well, most generally, as I just mentioned, resonance is the flow of electrons from a source to a sink internally, meaning that there is a reorganization of electrons within a molecule that doesn't change the chemical composition or the identity of the molecule per se, but does reorganize the building blocks within it. Most commonly, we see resonance important for the electron sources N and pi, and for the electron sinks A and pi star, which are sort of the analogous electron sinks. Essentially, lone pairs and pi bonds moving around is the traditional definition of resonance. And importantly, these sources and sinks need to be adjacent to one another for resonance to become important. To give you an example that we've already seen where resonance is important, a very common example, in fact, when a lone pair is adjacent to a pi bond or a double or triple bond, we see resonance becoming important. So the lone pair can serve as a source and the pi bond as a sink, and the resulting resonance structure has the same number of valence electrons, the same sigma bonding network, but what's changed are formal charges on the atoms involved, and so strictly speaking we have a new negative charge and a new positive charge after this electron flow. And the nature of the building blocks on each of the atoms X, so if the three atoms X have different elemental identities, then we're looking at different building blocks on the two outermost atoms. In fact, the building block on the central atom has remained the same, as we can see. So this is one example where a source is next to a sink. Let's look at another extremely common example. So when two pi bonds are adjacent to one another, and these could be double or triple bonds, resonance is very often important. So using one pi bond as a source and one as a sink generates a new resonance form. Where again, the nature of the building blocks within the molecule has changed, but none of the sigma bonds have broken, and no atoms have changed positions. These are classical requirements for resonance to be important. My goal in this webcast has been to show you how you can use the generalized building blocks, and in particular, seeing pi bonds and lone pairs next to one another, to identify when resonance might be an important possibility. That doesn't mean that resonance is important. So in a future lesson, we'll talk about the stability trends for electron sources and sinks. And in that lesson, you'll learn if you haven't already, in fact, you probably have already learned how to differentiate good and bad electron sources and sinks. The essence of when resonance is really important and can be a critical factor for solving a problem, for example, comes down to having good electron sources and sinks next to one another. But what you can use the building block formalism for is to recognize the possibilities. And recognizing the possibilities is, in my opinion, always the first step of solving any organic chemistry problem. You want to recognize what are all the possibilities for this problem and then separate kind of the wheat from the chaff, right? Throw out possibilities that are unreasonable, maybe because there's a poor electron source or sink involved, and hold on to the possibilities that are reasonable. With the reasonable possibilities in hand, you can move forward with those and distinguish between those using even finer comparisons and considerations. This is 
I think, an effective way to solve problems in organic chemistry.